Hello, people of God. It's good to be with you once again and to open God's Word together. I want to look at Exodus chapter 12, beginning at verse 43 and reading through uh, verse 51 as we read of the institution of the Passover. And so we want to read these verses together and then to think about them uh, briefly. So Exodus chapter 12, beginning our reading at verse 43. And let's pay careful attention, for this is God's own word. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside of the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If a stranger shall sojourn with you, and would keep the Passover to the Lord, tell all his males to be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land. But no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. All the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. Thus far, the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. Well, we've heard a little bit about the Passover already. Um, And what this passage does to remind us is that the Passover and the eating of the Passover is really a family function. It's a family function for the congregation and people of Israel. Um, It's a family institution. It's for the family to come together and to remember the Lord and what he's done. Uh, We know that all of the people of God are not Israel's descendants, right? We we know that from the last passage. This is a mixed multitude who go up. And God tells us a lot about this mixed multitude uh, in this passage. So the institution for Passover, not surprisingly, takes into account this mixed multitude. There are foreigners mixed in. Um, verse 43 talks about foreigners, those who are strangers among God's people. Um, verse 45 also talks about foreigners. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. Uh, this is a little different word in Hebrew for foreigner, and this seems more like a temporary resident. So the first one is a real stranger who's not a part of the people at all. Uh, this might mean more like a temporary resident, someone who's passing through in the people of God. And then there's the hired servant in verse 45, those who are merely employed by God's people. And God says specifically, they are not numbered among the people of God. They are not to be included in the Passover meal. They may not partake in the Passover meal. It's a household meal. It's for the household of faith. It's for the family of God. But notice also in verse 44 that slaves who are owned by God's people are to be included in the family institution of the Passover. Uh, Verse 44, but every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. Now, we don't have time right now to talk about in our little devotional uh, everything the Bible has to say about slavery. Sometimes when verses like this come along, and especially for Americans who have a history of slavery um, and that black stain that is on our nation, still um, we're still feeling the effects of that sin to this day. we can have a really hard time with any time the Bible talks about slavery. Uh, The Bible does not approve of or endorse it at all, uh, but it does deal with it as a reality of life. Um, Slavery was a reality of life in the ancient world, and the Bible, without approving it or endorsing slavery, does deal with it as a reality of life. Um, But the Bible does require God's people to have a completely different view and attitude towards slaves than the rest of the world did. the rest of the world would have considered slaves merely property. Uh, That's how the rest of the world would have thought of a slave. He's just your property, uh, the person you pay for. Um, Well, slavery didn't necessarily have a racial element back then, but it did have a property element. These people are my property. Um, But how does God want his people to think about them? Not as property, but in a sense as family, as being part of the household. Um, And this command needs to come to them with a particular force as those who've been slaves, who know what it is for harsh treatment. One of the sad realities, if you look back through history, it's almost, it's proverbial in history that some of the worst slave masters were former slaves. Uh, Some of the people who were the worst to mistreat their slaves were oftentimes people who had been slaves themselves. Um, it becomes almost proverbial that it would not be, it's not good to be the, the, the slave of someone who had been a slave. Um, And God's people, remembering their slavery, are to be different. They're not to be harsh 
Uh, they're not to think of them as property. Uh, they're to think of them as family. They were to circumcise them in recognition they were part of their household. Uh, they became part of the household. And when they ate the Passover, their slaves were to eat it with them. It was a reminder that they too, as circumcised and part of the household of God, were heirs to God's promise and had become part of God's covenant community. And the promise was extended to the whole household, including children and even the slaves of the household. And in that way, Israel was being given a powerful reminder to regard their slaves more like family and heirs of the promise of God than like property. They might be theirs bought with money, but they were co-heirs with them in the promises of God. Um, and notice also there's a provision for outsiders to come into God's covenant. Uh, we talked about the strangers, the temporary residents, the hired workers. They were excluded. Circumcised slaves were to be included. But there's another category that we read about in verse 48. Uh, what is that other category? Um, a stranger that is sojourning with you. Uh, so this is a person from outside, but they have become sojourners with them. This is another distinct category from the other categories that were mentioned. It means something more like a resident alien. Um, not someone who is temporarily passing through, like the other category that we looked at, um, but someone who has taken up residence among them. Um, that's how Moses was in Midian. Uh, he was a, a resident alien. He had taken up residence with them. Um, and God says, if you have people like that, resident aliens who've become sojourners with you, who are, who are strangers, but they're residing with you, um, have become kind of resident aliens with the people, um, they are invited to partake of this Passover meal if they will circumcise themselves and their households. If they are willing to do that as sojourners, then they're to be regarded just as if they were natives of the land. Um, that means they're to be regarded as natural-born Israelites, even though they are resident aliens. Uh, they're to be regarded as heirs of the covenant. They're not to be regarded as second-class citizens. Uh, they're to be regarded as as one them as among them right so verse 49 there shall be one law for the native and for the stranger stranger who sojourns among you uh, those who have cast in their lot by circumcision there's to be one law covering um, you're to be treated just as if you were a native of the land um, if you were a sojourner who has been willing to take on the sign and the seal of the covenant and what god's word is is teaching us here in driving home that you're either a part of the family god and uh, family of god and welcome at the family functions or you are strangers and aliens to the covenant and to its promises there's there's a family function there if you're part of the family you're welcome if you're not part of the family you have no part in that um, and we might look at these categories and say well you know that's not really the the world we live in anymore we don't think of the, the church isn't a national organization anymore. We don't think of it as, you know, residents and non-resident citizens and non-citizens. So we might look at categories like strangers, sojourners, resident aliens, say that's not the world we live in anymore. But for the church, that is the world we still live in. We have strangers who are not a part of the people of God in any, in any meaningful sense at all. Um, we have people who are temporary passers-by. Uh, people who will stop into a church every once in a while, uh, who will be there on Easter or Christmas, some of the high holy days. But really, they don't have any part of the church the rest of the time. They're, they're temporary passers-by. Um, they're strangers. Uh, they're strangers or they're, they're passers through. And the church can also sometimes have resident aliens, uh, people who are constantly in one church or another, going from place to place, maybe residing in a church for a time, but they're not members in any one place. Um, and God is teaching us something important about the doctrine of the church through this passage, that you're either part of the family of God or you're not. Right? Being circumcised in the Old Covenant was an all-in commitment to God's people. You know, No half measures are acceptable. Either you're in or you're out. And if you're a resident alien traveling with the people of God, you're out so long as you don't take on uh, the signs and seals of the covenant, so long as you are not part of the family of God. Um, you're either out or you're in. You're either a member or you're not. And if you're in, it means you're a part of the people of God every bit as much as anyone else. There's no such thing as first class and second class members. There's only out or in. If you're in, then the institutions of God are for you. Uh, that's the same thing today. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are for those who are with the people of God. 
not for people who are outside the people of God. And that's why if someone comes just wanting to be baptized, who's not a member of any church, uh, we wouldn't do that. If someone came and wanted to participate in the Lord's Supper, not member of any church, we wouldn't do that. Why? Because they're family. They're for people who are committed to the family, not strangers, not passing through, but people who are part of the covenant community. Um, and that's why we require church membership of people to participate in these things. Because people who aren't a member of any Bible-believing church, um, who aren't members of the people of God anywhere, really don't have a place at Christ's table. You have to be part of the family of God. Um, become a partaker in the family of God. Uh, not to remain a resident, a resident alien or someone who's just passing through. Um, it's important to be a member of the family. And we can learn something from the church, for the church, even from this, this proposition here. This is meant to be a family meal. This is meant to be a family blessing where we get together and we remember. Right, The Passover was important for the remembrance of God's people. Um, it remembered the expiation of the, the sins that are taken away by the sacrifice of the Lamb. They remember propitiation, the blood that turns away the wrath of God. It's nutrition. It's food for us on the journey of the Exodus, just as it was for them. And it's a reminder that God's people were saved to be sanctified, uh, that they were to eat of that unleavened bread to cleanse out the old leaven of Egypt and put on the new leaven of freedom. So there was a reminder of God's salvation in this meal. There was a reminder that we've been saved to be sanctified. That's also for the family of God. That's why other people are not to participate in that because if they've not united themselves to God, they're not united to God with those promises, the promises of expiation and propitiation and nutrition, that commitment of salvation that we are saved to be sanctified. We don't belong to that if we've not um, become a meaningful participant in the family of God. And then in this passage, two other important functions for the Passover are added. It's not a meal to go. Um, you're not to take it out of the house. You're to emphasize that family aspect. Even if a couple families come together to share the same lamb, everyone is to stay together. Um, I think that also has an implication for the slaves. You're not to send them somewhere else to eat. They eat with the whole household. They eat with the whole family. Everyone eats it together and the lambs of the of the the bones of the lamb are not to be broken the bones of the lamb are not to be broken in, in the killing and the cooking and the eating and even in the burning of the lamb uh, none of it is to be broken and why aren't the bones to be broken uh, it has a very important significance that's pointing forward to the coming of the lord jesus christ and his sacrifice as the Passover lamb. The true reason for not breaking the bones does not become clear until Christ is sacrificed on the cross. Um, people might have wondered at the time, why not break the bones? What's so important about the bones of this sacrificial lamb? Um, but what do we read in John chapter 19, verses 33 through 36? But when they came to Jesus and saw he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once out there came blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Why didn't they break the bones of the Passover lamb? It was meant to, to continue to keep that before their minds so that when Christ came and offered the sacrifice and not one of his bones was broken, it could be a wonderful way of God's people understanding he is the true Passover lamb. That as John said, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who is our expiation. As the cross speaks about the propitiation, the blood that turns away the wrath of God. As his body and blood are the nutrition for us, uh, feeding us and fueling us for our journey through this world into glory. That we are to continue to eat the unleavened bread, uh, to, to cleanse out the old leaven of Egypt and the new leaven of freedom in Christ. Also to remind them that if you're looking to understand who is the one who takes away sin, turns away wrath, provides himself as nutrition for our souls with his true body and blessed blood, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Passover lamb whose bones were not broken in the sacrifice. He is the one that God's people were always to look to. Um, and that's, that's how God's people were to know that Christ is the fulfillment of the promise. He is the one who takes away sin. His blood turns away. His body and blood are true food and drink 
unto life eternal. That's the blessing that's been conveyed uh, throughout the centuries in the Passover meal. So that when Christ came, they would know him, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one who the Father had sent, that we might know eternal life. Um, what a wonderful thing that God preserved this witness to Christ throughout the years, uh, throughout the many centuries until he came, so that God's people would know, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who turns away the wrath of, the God, of God, whose body is true food and true drink unto life eternal for those who eat of him. How thankful we are to God that Christ, the Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us so that we might be freed from our sins and find life in his name. May we do that by faith in him, not being content to remain outside as strangers, but coming in and enjoying the covenant and its promises. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the remembrance we have here of the nature of your covenant family, that you call us to be a part, uh, not to be strangers or mere passers through, but to be uh, those who are part of the family, who take on the commitments and who enjoy the benefits. We pray that, that all of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ would not be content to remain outside of the church. Uh, we know that you desire your people to be inside and to be part of families and that to be a Christian and outside of the church is an abnormality that needs to be rectified, that people who are outside and unattached need to come in and be part of the family, to partake of those things. And so we desire more and more people to come in. We desire to see strangers and pastors through and resident aliens become part of the family, to enjoy that one law that's for natives and sojourners, to enjoy the same privileges coming in and becoming natural-born citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Lord, we pray you would help us to proclaim your name, the goodness of Christ, the Passover lamb, to take comfort in the <clears throat> expiation he provides, taking away our sins, the propitiation we have by his turning away your wrath by his blood, the nutrition that he gives us in feeding us with his own body, uh, which is true food and true drink unto life eternal. And Lord, may we give you all the glory for providing us Christ, the Passover lamb, that not one of his bones was broken, but he laid down his life for sinners. We thank you for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. May we all put our faith and trust in him. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Help us more and more to cleanse out the old leaven and to put on the leaven of freedom that we have in Christ and to remember that we've been saved to be sanctified. Help us to serve you, we pray, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, people of God, it's been good to spend this time with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you until we meet again.